So welcome everybody for the Rocky Mountain Mathematical Physics Seminar. It is my pleasure to welcome today Professor John Bias from the University of California at Riverside. Professor Bias is a, an internationally well-known and leading expert in mathematical physics. He's particularly known for his work in quantum gravity, the application of higher categories to physics, and the cobordism hypothesis, which he stated in 1995 together with James Dolan. Today, John will speak about the tenfold way. Please. Great. Thanks very much for your invitation. I'm sorry I'm not actually there. Believe it or not, it was snowing half an hour ago here down in Riverside. So I, maybe I'd be warmer up in Boulder, although I doubt it, I guess. Actually, just half an hour ago, it started to snow here too. So, <laughs> okay. So, there's no escape from the snow, but that's okay. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, I'd like to talk about this thing called the tenfold way. Um, so, it started with work in condensed matter physics in the late 90s and going on into, the, into this century, where, in the simplest form, condensed matter physicists noticed that there are 10 different ways that Hamiltonians can get along with either time reversal symmetry or charge conjugation symmetry or both or neither. And I'll explain that. It's not very complicated, that idea. But it turns out to be part of a much bigger story. Um, it turns out to have roots in the foundations of quantum mechanics and group representation theory, which don't even require any connection to the space-time symmetries of time reversal and charge conjugation. So it's a, there's a more pure mathematical infrastructure behind it, which is relevant in various ways in physics. And it winds up being connected to the fact that there are 10 kinds of Clifford algebras, which I will explain what I mean by that, and also 10 so-called super division algebras, which are sort of like super versions of the uh, reals, complex numbers, and quaternions, the three familiar or more familiar uh, division algebras. So, so uh, this whole big combination of ideas is called the tenfold way. So I want to start at the beginning, though, and I want to tell you about something um, that came first called the threefold way. So in fact, what I want to do is I want to start out with some basic ideas in quantum mechanics, because I want to show you that this fancy stuff I'm talking about really grows naturally out of some very fundamental ideas. So this beginning part will be a review for people who are quite uh, familiar with quantum mechanics, but there are a few nooks and crannies of this familiar material that aren't so well explored, I think. So as I hope you know, you can use unit vectors in a Hilbert space to describe states or pure states in quantum mechanics. I'm only going to talk about pure states. Uh, but, it, but the pro transition probability between two states, that is the probability that if you put a system in the state phi and then look to see if it's in the state C, that probability doesn't change if you multiply either C or phi by a phase because you take the inner product, but then you take its absolute value and square it. So what that means is that pure states in quantum mechanics are not really unit vectors, they're really equivalence classes of unit vectors where two count is the same if one of the is equal to the other multiplied by a phase. There's no uh, experimental way to detect the difference between uh, two states that differ by a phase. Although you can, by adding states, adding vectors, you can get super uh, interference phenomena. But nonetheless, this is true here. And so you should really think of states as elements of the that are these equivalence classes. And the set of those equivalence classes is called the projective space P of H familiar in projective geometry, uh, maybe with a different outlook on it, where you think of it as the space of one dimensional subspaces of your Hilbert space. That's another way to think about it. Well, let's just think of them as equivalence classes of unit vectors. So what does this mean for us? Well, one thing it gives is Wigner's theorem, which he proved in 1931, where he was looking to see what are all the maps from the space of states to itself that preserve transition probabilities. And it turns out that they, he showed that they all come from one of two kinds of maps on the Hilbert space itself. So one kind, the more familiar kind, is unitary operators. 
Unitary operators from a Hilbert space preserve everything. They preserve addition, scalar multiplication, and the inner product. So of course they preserve transition probabilities. And normally when we're in a rush, we say that we describe symmetries in quantum mechanics by unitary operators. But there's another option, which is anti-unitary operators. So these preserve addition, but they don't preserve uh, multiplication by complex numbers. If you pull a complex number through a anti-unitary operator, it comes out complex conjugated. So we say it's anti-linear. And also we demand that it preserve the inner product up to, well, with a complex conjugation thrown in there. So those will again preserve the uh, absolute value of the inner product. Uh, so the hard part of this theorem is to show that these are the only two options. So now this is becomes uh, more, uh, the difference between these two options becomes more apparent when we look at symmetries that square to one, discrete symmetries that square to one. And there are th three super famous ones in physics, uh, parity, which is reflecting the X, Y, and Z coordinates, uh, charge conjugation, which is switching particles with antiparticles, or in condensed matter physics, which is actually more relevant here, switching particles with holes. So there are all sorts of kinds of condensed matter systems where you have holes, that is the absence of particles in certain states that act like particles themselves. And then some of these condensed matter systems will have symmetry where you can switch particles and holes, whereas others won't have this symmetry. And then thirdly, time reversal symmetry, switching the direction of time, or if you like, for example, switching the sign of the momentum of particles. And so systems could have any one or all, any subset of these symmetries, and they could also be symmetric under certain combinations like CP, PT, et cetera. So in other words, you might have a system where it has a symmetry only when you simultaneously reverse the direction of time and switch particles with antiparticles. Uh, the standard model is famous for having none of these symmetries except for CPT. Uh, all the other options are, are actually um, broken by the standard model. So now let's think about those. So say we have a symmetry that squares to one. So it's a map from the projective space to itself that preserves transition probabilities. And on the projective space, it squares to the identity map. So by Wigner's theorem, there are two different options. Either it comes from a unitary or an anti-unitary, but that unitary, if, it's, if that's what you've got, it doesn't need to square to one, it, it's just enough for it to square to a phase, because if it squares to a phase, uh, its effect on elements of the projective space will be that if you do it twice, you get back where you started from, because the projective space doesn't care about this phase. And similarly, an anti-unitary that squares to a phase would give you a symmetry of physical states that squares to one. But now these two options work out very differently because in the unitary case, you can get rid of the phase. You can define a new unitary operator, just take your old one, U, and multiply it by C to the negative one half. And now you have another unitary V, which squares to one, and which also gives the same effect on states. In other words, it also implements the map F because this phase is irrelevant on the states, which are vectors modulo phase. So in other words, in the unitary case, this phase C is not all that important. If you're dealing with a single unitary that squares to one, you can just make it by suitable change of conventions, you can make it go away. But that's not true in the anti-unitary case, which is the case that I'm more interested in now. Because then if you multiply your anti-unitary by a phase, it does not change the square of that anti-unitary. Because when you, if you think about what happens when you multiply J by a phase, if you, and then square it, if you pull that phase across one of those J's to get the phases next to each other, it gets complex conjugated. So you get the absolute value of that phase squared, which is one. So you can't make the phase go away in this case. But then there's another fact, which is the phase has to be either plus or minus one. And you see that as follows. So on the one hand, we know that because J is anti-unitary, if you pull this phase C across J, it gets complex conjugated. But on the other hand, this phase C is equal to J squared. And we know that J squared always commutes with J for any operator. Uh, and so 
So then we can, so then we see that also the phase commutes with J. So it commutes with J, but it also gets conjugated when you commute it with J. So the only way both of those things can be true for a phase is if the phase is real. So the phase has to be plus or minus one. So that's sort of interesting that you get two options in that case. So now, so the upshot of this is that if you have a symmetry that squares to one, we have these sort of three choices. It could either be implemented by a unitary, which you might as well say it squares to the identity, or it's implemented by an anti-unitary, but then precisely one of these options holds, either it squares to one or it squares to minus one. So now let's look at the anti-unitary case, which is the sort of more interesting case. If you have an anti-unitary operator on a complex Hilbert space and it squares to one, it actually acts a lot like complex conjugation, right? The complex numbers is a complex Hilbert space and complex conjugation is anti-unitary. And if you do it twice, you get back where you started from. So that is an anti-unitary that squares to one. So that's what you should have in mind when you think about this anti-unitary that squares to one. And you can copy various things that you already know how to do for complex conjugation. In particular, you can look at this, the uh, vectors that are unchanged by J and they will form a real vector space. They won't form a complex vector space, but they'll form a real vector space, which will actually be a real Hilbert space. That is, it will be closed under the, uh, under the, in the topology on your original Hilbert space. So there's a whole theory of real Hilbert spaces that's less well known than the theory of complex Hilbert spaces, but it works to a large extent the same way, although some more sophisticated theorems uh, don't, don't hold in the real case. So just like the real axis is sitting inside the complex plane, and you can get any complex number as a complex linear combination of real numbers, when we're in this situation, we get this real Hilbert space, and we say that our original Hilbert space is the complexification of that, meaning that any vector in H is a complex linear combination of vectors in this real Hilbert space. So, so that's what's going on when J squared equals one. Now the case where J squared equals minus one is even more exciting um, because in that case, we have this operator, it's anti-unitary that squares to minus one, but we also have the operator of multiplication by I and we can make up an operator that I could call K, which is uh, first do J and then do I. And so we get these three operators, I, J, and K now. And if you do a few calculations, pretty easy, fun calculations, you'll see that these three operators obey the same relations as the quaternion I, J, and K. That is I squared and J squared and K squared, they're all equal to negative one. So that's obvious except for K squared, but you have to do a little calculation to check that K squared is negative one. And then also I times J times K is equal to negative one, which is a fancy fast way of saying that these three operators all anti-commute with each other. And these relations were in fact precisely those scribbled on the wall by Hamilton in October, 1843, when he was walking along with his wife to a meeting of the Irish Royal Society. And he had been struggling to find a three-dimensional division algebra for many years and failing. And he found there's this four-dimensional algebra that turns out to be a division algebra, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, called the Quaternions. And he spent the rest of his life working with them. Now, if, if you think about these uh, operators, you may think that they remind you a little bit in some ways of the i, j, and k in the world of vectors and the vector cross product or vector dot product. But it's worth pointing out that the, all this was discovered by Hamilton before anybody knew about the vector dot product or cross product. Those were invented afterwards, inspired by the quaternions, by, by Gibbs, in fact. So anyway, what we're doing here is we're making our complex Hilbert space into something called a quaternionic Hilbert space. There's a whole theory of quaternionic Hilbert spaces, which are modules for the quaternions, which have, has an inner product that takes values in the quaternions and is complete in the resulting norm. Uh, 
And while that's less well known than the complex theory, it's a very nice theory. And there are even some results in the foundations of quantum mechanics that say that if you have some axioms that sound reasonable, then your system must be described by either a real, a complex, or a quaternionic Hilbert space. And then we're left with the mystery, why did nature pick the complex one, which I'll say a little bit about. <laughs> but, but anyway, what we're seeing is that in this case, we have a quaternionic Hilbert space, and our original complex Hilbert space is what mathematicians would call the underlying complex Hilbert space, meaning you just forget about J and K and just think about I, and then you're back to your original complex Hilbert space. So we're seeing here that R, C, and H all show up naturally in quantum physics. And this is in a way my part of my answer to the question, why does nature prefer complex Hilbert spaces to real or quaternionic ones? My answer is basically that in fact, it uses all three kinds. So, so what's so special about R, C, and H? Well, you may or may not know, but here I'll tell you. So I'm gonna define an algebra for the purposes of this talk to be a finite dimensional real vector space. So I only want finite dimensional algebras uh, with an associative product. So I don't wanna talk about the Actonians that are non-associative. And the product has to distribute over linear combinations and it has to have a unit element of one. So that's an algebra for me today. Uh, and then a division algebra is just an algebra where any non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So now there's this beautiful theorem due to Frobenius in the very late 1800s that there are just exactly three division algebras according to this definition here. Uh, you might say three real division algebras if you wanna be more specific because we're working uh, with real vector spaces here. Uh, and they are the real numbers, the complex numbers and the quaternions. So they're mathematically singled out in that way. But now the way that they show up in quantum physics which we've begun to see becomes even more clear if we think about systems with symmetries. So most often we describe symmetries in quantum mechanics by unitary representations of groups. Now you should object already because I've pointed out that anti-unitary operators are also important, but for now, let me just keep life simple and think about unitary representations. So a unitary representation of a group G on a Hilbert space H just consists of a bunch of operators which are unitary, rho sub g, from your Hilbert space to itself with the property that rho sends uh, the group multiplication to composition of operators and it sends the identity group element to the identity operator. So basically this is a way of talking about how a group can act on the Hilbert space uh, in a way that preserves all the structure of the Hilbert space. And this is how we often study symmetries in quantum mechanics. And it turns out to be very interesting to think about irreducible unitary representations. And a representation is irreducible if the only closed subspaces of your Hilbert space that are preserved by all these operators rho sub g are the zero dimensional space and the whole space, the whole Hilbert space h. So these are the ones that basically don't have any smaller pieces or smaller representations sitting inside them. And they are very important to study if you're trying to study all the representations. Basically, you first want to understand the irreducible ones and then think about the ways that you can stick them together to form more complicated representations, like with direct sum in, in particular of irreducible representations. So Dyson in, I think, 1964, I may have the year not exactly right, he wrote a paper called The Threefold Way, and considered an irreducible represent, unitary representation of a group on a Hilbert space and showed that exactly one of three options holds. So either there's an, an anti-unitary operator with J squared equals negative one that commutes with all the operators rho sub G, or there's an anti-unitary with J squared equals one which commutes with all the rho sub G, or there's just not any anti-unitary that commutes with all the rho sub G. The way I'm stating it, it almost sounds like a triviality, uh, but, but there, it's not completely trivial because um, I'm saying that these three cases are mutually exclusive. So the, the, the interesting aspect there is that if you have an anti-unitary with J squared equals minus one that commutes with all the operators rho sub G, then you cannot also have one with J squared equals one that commutes with the rho sub G. 
So that, that's the, so it's a trichotomy, a division into three cases. And then we've seen already a bit about these three cases that if, that if, in, if you're in this, uh, in this case here, we, then we can use that J, which by the way is unique up to, uh, is a uh, unique up to a phase uh, to make our Hilbert space into a quaternionic Hilbert space. And if J squared equals one, we can make our Hilbert space into a real Hilbert space. And if there's no anti-unitary anti that commutes with all the rest of G, then you can't really do anything. And so all you have is your complex Hilbert space. And sometimes group theorists, group representation theorists call this case like the complex case, the truly complex case which is maybe a little bit confusing because this is a complex Hilbert space in all three cases. But what I'm saying is that in one case, you can promote it to a quaternionic Hilbert space. And in the other case, you can find this real subspace lying inside it. Whereas in this case, you can't do either. So this is the threefold way. It's very nice. It shows how all three division algebras show up in, in the study of quantum physics. So for example, let's look at the spin J representation of SU2. So that's an irreducible unitary representation of SU2. And it turns out that there always will be an anti-unitary operator J that commutes with all the SU2 transformations. Now, right now I'm feeling a little bit bad about using the letter J for this operator because J makes you think of angular momentum in quantum mechanics and J squared makes you even think of angular momentum more but I wanted to call it J because of my fondness for quaternion. So, so this J squared has nothing to do with the angular momentum operator squared in, in quantum mechanics. It's just the square of this anti-unitary. And it turns out that this operator J will square to one when, when the spin is an integer, that's like the bosonic case, and it will square to minus one in the other case when the spin is a half integer. So they alternate in that way. So for example, the spin one representation of SU2 is a representation on C3. And you may know that that's really coming from a representation of the rotation group SO3 on C3. But where does that come from? Well, it's because three-dimensional rotations act on R3. So this C3 is really just the complexification of the obvious notion of rotations on R3. But the more interesting case is the uh, spin one half representation. So there, you actually are getting that this representation is the underlying complex representation of a quaternionic representation. So I'm saying that C squared is secretly a quaternionic Hilbert space or can be promoted to a quaternionic Hilbert space. What could that be? Well, it's none other than the quaternions itself. C squared is four dimensional as a real vector space. Quaternions are also four dimensional. So that's really all it, that's all it could be, but it's very beautiful. And the reason why it's so beautiful is because the group that we normally call SU2 and think of as two by two matrices of some sort, uh, another way to think about it is that it's the group of quaternions that have absolute value equal to one. There's a, a, a three sphere sitting in the quaternions consisting of all the quaternions of length one, and that's a group. Uh, and that is SU2, that's an, or it's isomorphic to SU2, and it acts on the quaternions by multiplication, either on the left or on the right. Um, if, if we let it act on the, on the right, then we get a quaternionic Hilbert space. And then the representation of SU2 uh, will commute with all those quaternion multiplications because it will be coming from multiplication on the left. So, so uh, if people had been more fond of quaternions when they were first understanding spin one half particles, Pauli wouldn't have needed to invent the Pauli matrices. They would have described all this stuff using quaternions, and it's very beautiful that way. Okay, so it's a general phenomenon. Any unitary representation of a that's irreducible can be chopped is, is of one of these three kinds. So if we have a unitary representation of a compact Lie group, then it turns out to be a fact that you can always break it up into a direct sum of irreducibles. And so we can take all the irreducibles that are quaternionic and take the sum of them and call that row of negative one. We can take the sum of the complex ones and call that row zero and the sum of the real ones and call that row sub one. And so that gives a canonical way to take any such group representation and chop it into a direct sum of three parts. 
And these three parts, I'm labeling them negative one, zero, and one for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's because this anti-unitary that I'm talking about could square to negative one or one or could not be there at all, which is sort of like zero. But a better reason why I'm calling it negative one, zero, and one, these three cases, is because those three numbers actually uh, form a subset of the real numbers that's closed under multiplication. So it's a three element monoid. It's not a group, right? Because a zero doesn't have a multiplicative inverse, but it's a three element monoid. And what we're saying is that we can, uh, so I'm gonna call it three with a Roman numeral three here, just for fun. And so I'm saying any representation of the kind I'm talking about here is automatically three graded. You can chop it up into these three subspaces. And the reason why that's especially nice is that if I take a tensor product of two representations, I can work out the three different parts of the resulting tensor product in terms of the various parts of the two representations I'm tensoring by means of this formula down here. So this formula is saying a bunch of things. For example, it's saying if I have two quaternionic representations and I tensor them because negative one times negative one is one, then I'll just get a real representation. Whereas if I tensor a real and a real, I get a real, or if I tensor a real and a complex, I get a complex. Because zero times anything is zero. If you tensor any sort of representation, any one of these three kinds with a complex one, you get a complex one. And maybe that in some ways explains the dominance of the complex numbers over the other two division algebras in this, in, in quantum mechanics. So in other words, if I combine a quaternionic system with a complex system, the result is complex. Okay, so my talk was called the tenfold way, but so far I've only gotten three tenths of the way there. So let's, let me talk about the tenfold way. So the simplest way to bump into it is if you're thinking about time reversal symmetry and charge con conjugation symmetry. Uh, and if you assume that they're described by anti-unitary operators, which commute, which is an assumption that's uh, not so much, not the, not the case in uh, quantum field theory, but it's in the case in condensed matter physics when we're thinking about the space of states of a single particle or a whole, then, uh, then it's very natural to, by what I've already said, to say that if, well, if these are anti-unitary, you could have, and because there are symmetries that if you do them twice, you get back where you started from, you should have either t squared equals one or t squared equals minus one, or you might not have t symmetry. And similarly, you have three options for charge conjugation symmetry. So that gives three times three or nine options. But then there's a 10th option, which is that you might only have some symmetry that acts like com com combined time reversal and charge conjugation symmetry. So reversing the direction of time and switching particles with holes, uh, doing both of those things. And that's sometimes called S, that combination. And it's good to uh, treat that as being unitary. And so in that case, you may as well just assume it's S squared equals one. So we get nine plus one more is 10 options there. And so now condensed matter theorists have done a lot with this and the most of it, which I will not get into at all, but just to give you like a microscopic taste, uh, there are systems, for example, like polyacetylene that don't have C or T symmetry separately, but they do have this combined symmetry S. So uh, polyacetylene is actually superconductive at low enough temperatures. And it, and it turns out that it's because solitons, collective excitations of electrons can move along the, uh, the, the, the uh, polymer and they, they, they have antiparticles as well. And so you have this, you have these symmetries. So there's a big classification of physical systems uh, via the tenfold way, most of which I'm, I'm not going to talk about. I'm not even really an expert on, on that as much as I'd like to be. So what I want to do is sort of dig a bit more into the math of where the tenfold way is coming from. In context, it may have little to do with charge conjugation and time reversal. And in fact, it arises naturally from super Hilbert spaces. Now, if you're someone who's skeptical of supersymmetry, don't be scared. So am I. So you'll see that this isn't this isn't that stuff. <laughs> so you'll see what I mean in a second. So a super Hilbert space is just a Hilbert space 
that's written as a direct sum of two parts, which I'll call the even part H0 and the odd part H1. So you can call a vector even if it's in H0 and odd if it's in H1, but a typical vector is a linear combination of an even and an odd part. So there are different ways to use these super Hilbert spaces physically. Now, the one that probably thinking of is that you let H0, the even part, describe states of bosons, bosonic excitations or particles, and let H1 be fermions. But actually in condensed matter physics, that's not the main application of super Hilbert, who, yeah, super Hilbert spaces. I was gonna say Hooper Silbert spaces. Uh, uh, that's not the main way they apply them. They have a different way of chopping a Hilbert space into two parts. So what they will often do is let H0 be a Hilbert space for particles and let H1 be a Hilbert space for antiparticles or holes. It's sort of conventional, which one you call H0 and which one you call H1. And that's quite natural, for example, if you're thinking about a single particle uh, solution of say like the uh, uh, complex Klein-Gordon equation, there'll be these, this is a picture of momentum space and there'll be states with momentum in this positive uh, future pointing mass hyperboloid and states in these past pointing mass hyperboloid. And you can call the states up here, states in L2 of this hyperboloid H0 and call this one H1. So now we can have anti-unitaries in this situation of various kinds and they could be even, that just means that they map the even part to itself and the odd part to itself. And you can have anti-unitaries that are odd. I mean, you can also have anti-unitaries that are neither, but I'm interested in these two particular cases. In condensed matter physics, uh, time reversal symmetry is often described by an even anti-unitary and charge conjugation by an odd anti-unitary, one that would be switching uh, things up here with things back down here. But I'm gonna use these letters T and C more mathematically just to describe any old even or any old odd anti-unitary. So they, from now on, don't think about time reversal and charge conjugation so much. That's not what I'm really talking about. I'm just using those two letters for these two kinds of anti-unitaries. So now let's look at symmetries in this situation. So let's look at unitary representations of groups on a super Hilbert space. Well, it's actually good to make our group be Z mod two graded. That is, it's make it be the union of an even part and an odd part with the rule that if you, that, that the multiplication of group elements works like this. So product of two even transformations is even, the product of an even and an odd is odd, and the product of an odd and an odd is uh, even again. So that mimics addition in Z mod two, not multiplication in Z mod two, <laughs> but addition in Z mod two. Um, and so then a unitary representation of a Z mod two graded group on a super Hilbert space, what it is, is it's just an ordinary unitary representation, but it, which gets along with these even and odd rules. So if you apply an even transformation to an even state, you get another even state, et cetera. Same type of rule that we have here. So this is just the uh, yoga of, uh, of super mathematics where you make everything be even and odd and you impose these type of rules, uh, which is the foundations of super symmetry, but also shows up all over the place uh, in, in, in mathematics. So we can define an irreducible unitary representation. Uh, it's a little bit different now because what we say is that the only closed subspaces that are the sum, direct sum of an even and an odd part that are preserved by all the group transformations are zero in the whole Hilbert space. Right, so not every closed subspace can be broken down as a sum of an even and an odd part. You could have some subspace that's sort of halfway slanted between these two subspaces, V0 and V1. Uh, so, but here we're, we're religiously imposing this doctrine that we're like interested in even and odd things. So these are the kind of sub-representations that we want to exclude when we have an irreducible representation. So now what we can do that we're in this super land is we can copy Dyson's question, uh, copy his threefold way, question and ask what kinds of irreducible representations are there? In other words, what kind of uh, anti-unitaries can you have to commute with everything 
in an irreducible unitary representation in this Z2 graded world or super world. And now it turns out there are 10 options. So Dyson's threefold way turns into the tenfold way. And the idea is you look at the commutant of an irreducible unitary representation of a Z mod two graded group on a super Hilbert space, meaning the set of all operators that commute with all the rows of G, but I wanna allow all the real linear operators, not just the complex linear ones, because I'm interested in the anti-unitary ones in particular. And so it turns out that you can either have an anti, even anti-unitary with one of these three properties. So one of that, that's a trichotomy. You just get one of those three options, but you also independently get one of these three options as to whether there's an odd anti-unitary that squares to one, negative one, or no such C. And then finally, so that's three times three or nine options, but then there's a 10th option where you have no such T or C, but you have an odd unitary operator. And then you can assume it squares to one. Phases always commute with everything, uh, but they give even unitaries. So that's, that's, this is more unusual, this odd unitary. So we have these 10 options and these 10 different kinds, well, they form a 10 element set, which I will call X Roman numeral 10. Maybe I'll say the word 10. Uh, and so the same sort of thing happens that happened with Dyson. I can take any unitary representation of a Z mod two graded group on a super Hilbert space. And if it's a direct sum of irreducibles, for example, if G is compact, then I can take all the irreducibles of each of the 10 kinds and lump them together and use that to break my representation into 10 pieces. And then the beautiful part is that there's a way to do addition in this 10 element set that makes this rule for tensor products work that's like what we had with Dyson. So there are 10 kinds of, ir of, uh, of representations, of irreducible representations, and, and when we tensor them, they, they obey this type of rule. And so this 10 element set here has an addition on it that makes it into a monoid that's commutative. So let me show you this 10 element thing. So here it is. It's very odd in a way at first. It's a disjoint union of two different groups. It's a disjoint union of the group Z mod eight and the group Z mod two. Now you can't take the disjoint union of two groups and make that into a group usually. That's like a horrible thing to want to do. But here we are making it into a monoid. And the way it works is the follow. If you add two guys in Z mod eight, you do it the usual way. If you add two guys in Z mod two, you do it the usual way. Well, that's easy enough, but what happens if you add a guy in Z mod eight to one in Z mod two? That's when all hell breaks loose. What you do is you add them, but then you go, you take the mod two. <laughs> so in other words, if I have an element of Z mod eight, I can figure out what it is mod two. And, and that would bridges the gap here. So I'm gonna think of this 10 element set as like having eight numbers zero through seven here, which are in Z mod eight, and then two bold face numbers zero and one, which are in Z mod two, and so if I add the light face numbers, I do it the usual way in Z mod eight. Uh, here, the bold face ones I add in Z mod two. And then if I add a, a light face and a bold face one, well, like here I'd get seven superficially, but then I look at it mod two. And so I get bold face one. So this is a very peculiar thing. And you will see why this 10 element set is naturally broken down into an eight element part and a two element part. In a, in a few minutes. But anyway, here's a, here's a picture of it. Um, so here we have like a clock on the outside with eight hours going from zero to seven. So that's Z mod eight. And then you have like a little clock on the inside going from zero to one. And here I'm, by each hour, I'm listing the anti-unitaries and their, and their properties. So the, the boldface zero is when we don't have any anti-unitary uh, symmetries and also don't have this S symmetry. Here's where we have the S symmetry. And then here we have various combinations of C and T symmetry. You'll notice the T symmetry choices go across like this. Well, sorry, we get T squared equals one, T squared equals minus one. And the uh, C squareds are these vertical columns. So this is a very mysterious pattern that just pops out. 
but we can sort of understand it because just as our three element set was the set of division algebras, this 10 element set is really the set of super division algebras. So a super algebra is just an al algebra that has an even and an odd part where the multiplication obeys this by now, hopefully somewhat familiar rule. And so you can talk about a super division algebra. It's just a super algebra where any non-zero element that's either even or odd, so not a linear combination of those two, but just purely homogeneous, all even or all odd, has a multiplicative inverse. So for example, you can make the complex numbers into a super division algebra in two different ways. In one, the, like the more familiar way, both real and imaginary numbers count as even. But in the other, the real axis is the even part and the imaginary axis is the odd part. And it works out, right? That if like, if you multiply two imaginaries, you get a real again and so on. So there are more possibilities for super division algebras than for division algebras. And uh, the topologist CTC Wall and later the uh, famous mathematician of Deline, algebraic geometry, you might call him, I suppose, uh, classified the super division algebras and saw that they're 10 and that they're all Clifford algebras. Now, Clifford algebras are a topic that shows up in a, other places in mathematical physics. After Hamilton invented the quaternions, Clifford generalized them by introducing algebras that have more square roots of either plus or minus one that all anti-commute with each other. And later on, those were reinvented as Pauli matrices and Dirac matrices uh, and used to describe spin one half particles. But Clifford algebras are, are a generalization that lets you describe spin one half particles in any dimension of space time. So that's not what we're talking about here. And nonetheless, they sh these Clifford algebras show up because they give you these superdivision algebras. And so they give you the 10 options uh, that we've been talking about in that funny clock. So there are these Clifford algebras where you take n anti-commuting square roots of negative one. I'm writing them as gamma i to remind you of gamma matrices, but although these are not in Lorentzian signature. Uh, and you so you get Clifford, you get the superdivision algebras from these up to and including when you include uh, three square roots of minus one. But when you include four square roots of minus one, you get something that's not a superdivision algebra. But we'll see what's going on with that in a minute. Uh, so you see, I got four superdivision algebras this way. But then I could also make up other Clifford algebras. I'll just be cute and call them Cliff negative n, where I throw in anti commuting square roots of positive one. So, for example, if I take the real numbers and throw in a, a a square root of positive one, I don't get the complex numbers. I get this algebra, which is just isomorphic to R direct sum R. Um, and I can keep on going. And for a while, I get superdivision algebras again. But when I go up to the fourth one, I don't. So it turns out that neither Cliff four nor Cliff negative four is a superdivision algebra. But in fact, they're, both of these algebras are what are called Morita equivalent to the quaternions which we can think of as a superdivision algebra in various ways, but we can think of it as a superdivision algebra in the most obvious way where every element is even. So what's this Morita equivalence business? Well, we're very often interested in representations of algebras or representations of super algebras. And so you say that two super algebras are Morita equivalent if they're categories of representations on super vector spaces are equivalent. So, so if you see so that, it's a really interesting thing that shows up in physics that sometimes you could have different uh, algebras, but as far as the representations go, you can't tell the difference. And in particular, there's a thing called bot periodicity that has many facets, one of which is that cliff n plus eight is Morita equivalent to cliff n. So the, uh, there are many different Clifford algebras with both positive and negative n going on infinitely in both directions. There are only eight different classes of them if you care about their categories of representations. So we've gotten those eight under our belt and we've seen that each uh, kind corresponds, has within its uh, equivalence class a uh, 
well, it has within its equivalence class a superdivision algebra. So that's eight, but I called it the tenfold way. Well, here, eight. So, so this is the clock again, but now drawn in a round format. Uh, and and um, you'll notice that cliff zero, we're not throwing in any square roots of anything. So we just get this real numbers, which is a purely even superdivision algebra. And here, cliff four is Morita equivalent to the quaternions thought of as a purely even uh, division algebra. And these others are, are truly super, that is they have an even and an odd part. But there are two more because you can also start with the complex numbers and start throwing in square roots of one or minus one. Uh, but when you do that, because you have I around, it doesn't really matter whether you throw in square roots of one or minus one. Uh, so, so you could just start with the complex numbers with nothing else in it as an even superdivision algebra. And then you could throw in a single square root of one or of minus one, and you'd get a superdivision algebra uh, that's isomorphic to C direct sum C. And here again, we get a version of bot periodicity, but it, it's much more boring. It's just the cliff N plus two is more equivalent to cliff N. So complex Clifford algebras have a period two phenomenon. So that's where the Z mod two and the Z mod eight are actually coming from. We have this Z mod eight group of Morita equivalence classes of superdivision algebras. And each class has a superdivision algebra in it. And then we have this Z mod two uh, bunch as well. But they fit together into this larger structure, the tenfold way. So, so this is what we've gotten. So I'm basically winding down now and just trying to sort of put the pieces together. So we found, uh, or at least I've told you that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between three different things here. So there are 10 ways that unitary or anti-unitary operators can, can be, exist that commute with an irreducible unitary representation of a Z mod two graded group on a super Hilbert space. I should have said Z mod two graded group. There's a technical difference there. Um, and there are 10 Morita equivalence classes of Clifford algebras. And there are also 10 super division algebras. And the way to see them all in the same picture, it would look like this. So here I'm drawing the, the Clifford algebras and their division algebra or superdivision algebra representatives, and also the choices of the uh, symmetries C and T. And I should emphasize that although this is known to be true, that it still somewhat remains somewhat mysterious. For example, it's not if, if, it, if you feel that it's not obvious how, for example, like from the quaternions, we're getting this one operator C squared equals negative one, whereas from the complex numbers, we're getting what looks like more, that's, that's good. It's good that you're, you're confused. Uh, you actually have to really work through the details of, of the story that I've discussed to see that, for example, when you, <laughs> to, to go back and forth between the two, to go back and forth between representations of, of the Clifford algebra called C on complex Hilbert spaces and finding op operators T squared and C squared that obey this on it. So I, I know how to show this is true by sort of painstaking constructions in each case, not all that painstaking, but let's sort of hand by hand, or sorry, uh, careful hand work uh, figuring them out, but I still find it somewhat mysterious and sort of beautiful as well, the, the patterns that are that are showing up here. So, so what I'm basically trying to say is that the uh, condensed matter physicists, when they came upon this tenfold classification of states of matter based on time reversal and charge conjugation symmetry, they were tripping onto a very interesting mathematical subject, which I think is much better understood by now. I should emphasize that if you want to learn more about it, the paper by Greg Moore and a course notes by Gregory Moore uh, are a really good place to look. But 
But even though it's much better understood now, I don't think it's been really polished to the point where I feel like it's uh, there's there's no mystery left. Um, and I would like to I would like to get to the point of understanding those mysteries. Uh, I'll stop here though. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. So uh, I open uh, the questions now. Okay, I see. Andrew, you have a question, please? Yes, I, I do. John, you made the very interesting statement that I think you said you don't believe in supersymmetry. And of course, <laughs> supersymmetry is a, the basis of a lot of physics nowadays, including string theory and supergravity. And there are some arguments that you need supersymmetry for, to have a, a renormalizable theory, uh, thanks to the cancellation between bosons and, and fermions. So would you like to explain more what you mean? <laughs> uh oh, why did I say that? Well, that wasn't what my talk was about at all, of course. I, I just wanted to reassure people that that uh, when I started saying super, that this would not like turn into a talk that was only of interest to people in supersymmetry. Nonetheless, I, I meant what I said. Um, there, I, I think it's interesting that particle physicists haven't made any truly new, really new fundamental predictions that have been confirmed since 1980. And although I certainly believe in supersymmetry as a powerful mathematical concept that's leading to these wonderful uh, mathematical structures. And it's possible that I'm just impatient and that 40 years isn't long enough to for them to have like, uh, found evidence for supersymmetry. But as you know, they were all quite optimistic they would find it at the Large Hadron Collider, and that hasn't happened. And, and because, because there's so little evidence for this symmetry, and I don't see any physical reason to believe it, except, of course, that, yes, as you say, that, in, that, that we don't know how to build renormalizable theories of quantum gravity without it. Uh, it makes me suspicious that something else, that there's like some things that we don't understand, some big things that we don't understand that will be there, that, we'll, that we need to understand before we can make progress. I should point out that there's a, a large amount of room and energy in the energy scale between the Large Hadron Collider and the Planck length. And, and uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we like discover all sorts of shocking things before we get to a, uh, a theory of quantum gravity. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Daniel. You have another question and then Howie. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I'm wondering, I know when you have an anti-unitary that has say t squared equals minus one, you have the physical consequence of Kramer's degeneracy. So I'm wondering what are sorts of physical consequences of these different options in the tenfold way? That's a great question. I don't know if I'm the, gonna be the quickest on the uptake there. Um, so, so every, yeah, so, so I, so I don't know if I'll be able to give you a really beautiful answer to that. Um, the let me see what I want to say. Typically, the way we would think of this is that the way the way the um, yeah the, the, the for so for example. Yeah, so we were we were thinking of a situation where we have our Hilbert space broken into the direct sum of two parts. So now you could think of that in a couple of ways. The way that I was sort of proposing thinking of it is to think of those as the particle part and the anti-particle part. Um, and so then, and then what we would do is think of T as preserving each part, not switching particles and antiparticles. So then when you have T squared equals negative one, then it would be doing what you're used to, 
for those anti-unitaries that squared a negative one. And it'll be doing it separately on the particle space and on the whole space. Uh, so it'd just be like the usual story, but in for both of those two separate spaces. Um, whereas for C, it would be switching those two spaces. If you demanded that it commute with the Hamiltonian, then I guess you'd still be getting the, this type of degeneracy you're talking about, but it wouldn't necessarily be sort of, it wouldn't, the energy, it wouldn't necessarily be separately acting on, on, the, on the particle and the whole part. That's the best I can do right now. It's a great question, but I haven't been thinking about that exactly. Okay. Thanks so much. That's a very practical question. So I should come back down to earth and try to <laughs> think about that more. Yeah. Uh, Howie, I don't know if Howie is able. Oh, good. It turns it's out there's a up. physical mute button on the system here that we had to press. Um, uh -huh. yeah, so as come up and uh, ask your question. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about graded algebras in general, not just like super algebras, does the tenfold way like suggest any sort of correspondences for more general like gradings? What what type of gradings are you interested in? Uh, I'm just I'm just asking in general. Anything other than Z two in this case? Sorry, you say anything but Z mod two? Is that what you're? No, saying? no. I'm, I'm saying. Uh, I'm saying any other grading, like we were talking about no grading at the beginning and then uh, Z2 oh. grading. So for okay. more general gradings, is there any uh, okay. just, just any yeah. sort of correspondences? Yeah. Um, there, there are different versions of this stuff. Yeah, so, um, so some mathematicians have classified the things like superdivision algebras, but for like Z mod N graded vector spaces. Um, and I would love to have some good physical reason to think about those. Um, but for some reasons, like Zima 2 is so much more useful, apparently, than Zima 3, for example, but th that, that I haven't yet uh, convinced myself that I should have a good excuse to think about it. But, but I'll just say like one kind of thing is if you do the, just for example, if you did the classification with Zima 3 graded uh, algebras, instead of this big, heavy emphasis on Clifford algebras, where you have a whole bunch of things that square to one or minus one, you'd start getting things where cubing to one became important. Uh, so you'd get so you get some new, more exotic kinds of algebras showing up, and then and then some of them would be super division, or I don't know if super isn't the word for it anymore, but some of them would be the graded division algebras. Okay, yeah. So somebody in some, when I gave a talk about this at the Perimeter Institute, they were saying that some work on anions and thin films is finding some kind of like Z mod N graded algebras showing up. And so, I haven't had time to look into that yet to see if that could be like a good enough excuse for me to <laughs> to ponder those Z mod N graded division algebras. We have a question in the chat now too. Oh, um, right now I'm not. I can read it if you seeing like. the chats for so it'd be maybe faster if you. Yeah, we have a question from Connor McCraney. Um, you said at the end that you can perhaps painstakingly go through and construct anti-unitaries by hand. Could you speak just a bit about how this construction goes? Is it, is it essentially just going through the details of the proof of Wigner's theorem, or is there something else going on? It's definitely something else going on. Um, so, so for example, in this chart of mine here, You'll notice that this column here is a column that has C squared equals negative one. And, and this and that's and that's because when we're going around this way around this wheel, we're we 
to start out by throwing a single square root of negative one in, and then we start throwing some more in. That first square root of negative one that we throw in, that is our C, that is our operator C. It could be quite confusing because you, because <laughs> you don't normally think of I, the square root of negative one is an anti-unitary operator, uh, but you have to realize that this algebra I'm calling cliff one, we're thinking of this as a real algebra. So it's acting as real linear transformations of our complex Hilbert space. And so this I in the complex numbers, it's actually not acting as like normal multiplication by I on our complex Hilbert space. It's, it's giving some new operator that squares to negative one. And it's actually, in, turns out it will be an anti-unitary operator and it will give us this negative one. So we get this negative ones, the C squared equals negative one from there. And then when we go around the other way around the wheel, we start out by throwing in a square root of positive one. And that's what's giving us these C squareds here. Uh, but as you can see, that's just like part of the story because now you're wondering like, well, what about all these T squareds? Where are they coming from? And why do they like appear and then disappear and so on? So, so it, I have a web page called tenfold.html where I where I'm working this stuff out where I show how to do it. Um, so but I but I think it's not better for me to say anything more about it right now because it's just sort of uh, a little bit fiddly. And so yeah, I just would like so so it's it's building on the threefold way, but it's definitely something different. And I I I feel that ultimately there should be some like more beautiful way to to explain what's going on here and okay. it's and it's part of why i want to do that is because it's actually really amazing that clifford algebras are showing up here at all right because in yeah. physics we almost always think about clifford algebras when we're thinking about representations of the spin group the double cover of the rotation group that's not why they're showing up here the reason why they're showing up here is it just happens and and ctc wall was the one to realize that is that every uh, super division, every Clifford algebra is Morita equivalent to a super division algebra. Um, so, but, but it makes me feel that there's something we don't understand here yet because, because we were like just messing around with abstract quantum mechanics and then somehow Clifford algebras, which we associate to spin groups are showing up. I feel that there's like, may, might be something clever that we could do with this surprise mm -hmm. appearance of Clifford algebras if you're a little bit smarter than than we are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Are there further questions? Okay, I actually I have one too. And uh, that's the following. Um, you started with the Hilbert space and then the corresponding projective Hilbert space um, uh -huh. as the space of states. Um, so we are here in, uh, in Boulder working in, in my group and uh, with collaborators a lot with uh, C star algebraic approach to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So what if you have a C star algebra, um, what you get this, you, you can have various super selection sectors, meaning equivalence classes of uh, um, representations of the C star algebra on Hilbert spaces. and. I frankly have no idea. Is there a possibility, or have you thought about extending what you have done to, um, I mean, state spaces of C star algebras, uh, which possibly could fall into different connected components, meaning uh, super selection sectors, or um, maybe it even doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it's uh, just something which came up uh, as an idea. And uh, have you thought about that, or? I've only thought about it a tiny bit. I was trying to, I was trying to imagine ways of pushing this theory further. And one simple idea I had, which I haven't really explored yet much, was to instead of thinking about Hilbert spaces, thinking about modules of a of a commutative C star algebra. So mm -hmm. which you can get nice ones from bundles of Hilbert spaces. Yeah. And I was thinking 
about the question of whether there could be a more interesting classification in, when you start working with those, those bundles, that there could be some kind of uh, topological twists yeah. involved in the classification. And part of why part of why that might be interesting is because um, these groups, Z mod eight and Z mod two, they're called the Brouwer group, the, yeah. the Brouwer groups of, well, I guess the inner one is called the Brouwer group of the real numbers and the outer one's called like the super Brouwer group of the, of the, of the, of the real numbers. And Brouwer groups also show up. So those are Brouwer groups of, of, uh, of fields. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but there are also Brouwer groups of, of, of commutative rings, which are studied mm -hmm. in algebraic geometry. And they, mm -hmm. they, they, can be, they can be more interesting than just, because, obviously, because commutative ring has a much more interesting structure to it than just a, a field. And uh, you can sort of think of like a, the spectrum of a commutative ring as a space, and for a field, it's just a point. So I was, mm -hmm. I think there's something that could go in that in that direction to make this study more interesting, but I haven't gone in that direction. So it's a little bit different than what you're saying, but still, I think maybe yeah, it was, related yeah. to what you're saying, actually. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. So I think, I guess the only thing I could advise is that you might start trying to think about, maybe you already have, but to think about uh, the role that anti-unitary operators play in in what you're doing mm -hmm. and and i guess also yeah i guess that's the that's that's all, all all i can say so in some sense in this in this type of story the unitary symmetries are pretty boring in what i'm talking about here which is funny yeah. of course because those are the most uh, commonly studied but the anti-unitaries are giving us this interesting structure Oh yeah, okay. That's that's really quite interesting. Okay, great. No more questions. Then uh, let me thank the speaker again. Thanks. So it's great to John, see you. John, all. Before you go, I just yeah. want to make a comment that I actually knew CTC War way back in my misbegotten youth. Uh huh. In England. Yes, in uh -huh. Liverpool. Oh great! Oh. Yeah, I, I, I've become fascinated by why he wrote this paper, which seems to be so futuristic, uh, because he was basically sort of st studying super division algebras and super algebra back in I guess it was like 1968 or something like that. I mean, it comes from algebraic topology and, mm -hmm. and bot periodicity, but he was really pushing it in an unusual direction, which has become much more uh, close to what people are interested in now. So I, I don't know anything about him, but I'm curious about him. I, yeah. I can give you absolutely not no clue as to <laughs> what was going on his in his mind. Oh, well. Because although he was absolutely brilliant mathematically, which was very clear, he was almost impossible to communicate with. <laughs> You've met people like that. I've, I've heard they exist, yes. <laughs> okay, let me just uh, thank you again. Sure. And uh, see you at the next uh, Mathematical Physics Seminar. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.